Hey everybody, it's Derek Martin from CodeOpinion.com. Indirection is one of the most common techniques that we use in software design. It's basically adding a new layer or unit between two existing layers. We use indirection for things like enabling reuse, isolating complexity, abstracting dependencies, and more. Indirection has a lot of benefits, but it also comes at a cost. This video is sponsored by .NETOS Essentials the free .NET Online course that contains the most important lessons from .NETOS brand courses. Async Expert, .NET Diagnostics Expert, and c -sharp 9 Professional. All in one place, created for you to learn the basics and more advanced topics from .NET. Join today for free at essentials.netos.org. First, let's talk about some examples in direction, and then I'll show it actually in code. So what we're referring to with indirection is we have a caller calling some particular target and what we're doing is we have these two units or layers, but we're gonna add some indirection by adding something in the middle. And we do this all over the place. The, the, I would suspect the most common place this is done, or people think about this, if they think about layers, is adding a data access layer. So you have some calling code, some caller code, you need to access your database, but instead of writing that code directly from your caller, you're gonna have some data access layer that's gonna kinda of have the complexity uh, related to making that data access call. But there's other examples of this, even outside of code that you may or may not realize, is if you're using a message broker or queues, you're basically sending messages or events to a broker or to a queue, and then you have a consumer consume those and pick those up. And again, this is indirection because you have a publisher and a consumer that are kind of working at different paces. Another way of thinking about this from not a code perspective is a load balancer. And this allows horizontal scaling. So you have your browser not directly um, interacting with your web application, but rather it's hitting a load balancer. Your load balancer is hitting the appropriate um, available web app. So there's a lot of different ways to kind of think about this. And to me, a lot of it, the way that you probably see this are with behaviors. If you're using something like the decorator pattern or you're creating a pipeline for a request, whether it be an HTTP request or a message, you're adding indirection. Another common way is what I call like just wrapping some particular dependency that you have, where because you wanna narrow what the API surface looks like um, for that dependency. So we do this often where we have a dependency, we wanna create our own abstraction over top of that. As I mentioned with loose coupling, whether you're using queues or topics with a message broker, it's, a, it's another way of basically adding uh, indirection. And probably the one that's, I would say, used the most for, for layers and indirection is to isolate either complexity or technical concerns with something like um, a data access layer or a business logic layer or whatever the case may be, your domain model. Um, you, you want to isolate things into smaller units or layers, so that's how we're adding indirection. So some of the benefits of indirection are reuse. You can reuse complexity that you have, isolate it in a particular place, and reuse that throughout your system. And you have some flexibility because if you have a dependency that you can abstract over and create your own abstraction, you can depend on that rather than the third-party dependency. But again, as I mentioned, it does come at a cost. So what are those costs? For me, there's two things, mental capacity and performance. To illustrate these, I'm gonna jump into some code and show some real world examples of indirection. So I'm in the eShop on web sample application, and this is the order controller. If we're looking at the my orders method here, this particular route, what it does ultimately is it wants to show a list of orders for the user that's logged in. So our first case of indirection is we're actually using the mediator pattern to create a query object so that we can pass that off and actually handle that logic somewhere else. So if we jump over to the get my orders handler, which mediator will invoke, we can see that what we're doing is we're building out and returning our order of view model that ultimately is passed in our view to generate the HTML. But how do we get the data? Through more indirection. So in this case, we have our order repository with this list that's getting out all our orders. So if I look at the iOrder repository, specifically the implementation here, the order repository, we can see that it also extends the EF repository and the interface for that has some basic stuff that you would think, get by ID, list, add, update, etc. So if I jump back over to it being used, we can see that it's actually uh, specifying a specification. 
And that's because we need to filter our orders by user. We don't want to return all the orders. We want to return the orders for a specific user that was defined in our request. So in order to do that, we have this customer orders with item specification. So this is um, extending the specification of T, which is order. And we're kind of doing our filter here and including some other data like the line items and the actual item ordered, which is like the product. So again, here we have our controller that's accessing mediator, mediator sending it to our handler. And then our handler is getting data via the repository, which ultimately behind the scenes, that repository is actually using entity framework, which is hitting the database. So to kind of visualize that, we have our controller in ASP.NET calling mediator, mediator's calling our handler. We're calling a repository that's ultimately calling entity framework that's calling our database. So that is all the interaction that we have through that request. If we remove all that interaction, it's simply the controller using entity framework hitting the database. So I'm not implying that you should remove interaction or that interaction is bad. It's not, it has its place. In this particular case, that interaction is isolating things like the actual logic, it's taking out the dependency from ASP.NET Core. And that's the benefit of having that interaction with Mediator is that you're removing uh, having your application logic have any dependency on ASP.NET Core. The same thing with the repository. It's your abstraction, your I repository that is hiding entity framework. It's arguable whether you should do that or not, but the cost there in all of this is as I showed all the indirection, it's just the mental capacity to understand throughout a full request. And this was a simple example of the more indirection that you have, just the harder it is to mentally understand how the request is going through from start to end and all the different branches and the different ways that it can go from one layer calling another layer. So the mental capacity alone is one aspect. The second aspect I mentioned is performance. And let's jump back into some code so I can illustrate this. So looking at this get my orders handler again, when it's fetching out all these lists of orders, it's using this specification. And I was curious where else the specification was being used and why the specification pattern was happening in the first place. And again, this is a very simple sample application, but where it was being used was in one other place. And specifically, it was used in another handler that's for getting out an individual order. So it can kind of show the order details of that order. But what it's doing is it's calling list with that specification to get out all the orders. So if you had 100 or more orders, you're actually pulling all of those from the database. And again, you're pulling the order details, line items themselves, the product associated to those line items. So you're pulling a lot of data here. And then in memory, it's filtering out to just get that specific order that's being tried to be viewed. But that's not even, so that's one aspect, but that's not even the one I was concerned with originally was that in this particular case, we're sharing that order view model uh, for this details list page, like listing all our orders, as well as viewing an individual order. So I was curious of, okay, well, this order view model, we're returning this list to our controller that we can use with Razor. And what Razor is doing in this particular case, we're actually only showing the, the order itself, nothing to do with the line items, nothing to do with the products for the line items. That was just used in kind of the detail page. So in this particular case, Yes, we're fetching out the relevant orders, but we're fetching out a lot more information that we actually need. We're returning all the line items, which we don't care about. And for all those line items, it's actually also pulling in the actual products associated with those line items, which we also didn't, don't care about. So what's going on here is we have this concept of reuse with indirection and with our data access, but it's because it's so generic and we want to reuse it, uh, the performance implication here is that we're overfetching data, we're overbuilding um, uh, what this view model is because we don't care in this particular case what's used for this view. We don't care at all about the items or the products. So those are where the performance implications are, is that we're not really leveraging um, as well as we could about the data that we're selecting because we're using this indirection of this order repository that's kind of use built for reuse. So if we remove that indirection, we can gain our performance back by instead just using the actual entity framework context directly, doing our same include in where statement, but we're only including the line items so that we can actually add up to get our totals. And then instead of sharing a different view model, rather what I have here is I have a view model built specifically 
for this razor view. So it doesn't have all the items in it, the line items, the products. It's just simply a the order number, the date, the total, and the status. And that's what we're actually building up. So we're actually only selecting and building up the data that we need. There is no reuse. We're not reusing anything because the details page and the list page were completely different in terms of what they actually needed. So in that particular example of moving the indirection of the repository and removing the reuse of the separate view models, I gain performance, but I lose potentially some testability. And that really depends on kind of your dependencies and how testable that they're made uh, to begin with. Is Entity Framework testable? Yes. Is it as easy as testing a repository where you can create your own fake? No. So again, it's contextual on whether you want that testability, that isolation, that reuse, but it can come at a cost depending on how you're doing it. And that cost in most cases is performance because things become more generic to provide ability for a wide case of use cases as opposed to in that particular handler, uh, getting rid of that use and making it specific to get the data it needs. So again, the whole point of this video really was to think about indirection and to really think about it on whether you need it, if it's helping and kind of what the kind of the cost benefit is and make sure you're kind of always on that positive side because if it's not providing benefit, really question whether you should have it. And if there's performance considerations in certain places, maybe you remove indirection because there's certain hot paths that matter. But again, just being aware of the indirection you're adding and whether it's a net positive. If you found this video helpful, please give it a thumbs up. If you have any thoughts or questions, make sure to leave a comment and please subscribe for more videos on software architecture and design. Thanks.